Okay, thanks for the introduction. Welcome everyone here at ETH and the ones at home as well. So I'm Maria Husman and as uh, was said, I will talk about digital building twins. For me, this is also a bit about as a computer scientist, um, how can I work for a sustainable future? And I think um, I'll give you a bit of an introduction to my work at Siemens today. So part of it is about the domain, what do we do? But part of it, especially the second half, will be more technical. So I assume you all have a technical background and can handle some details, hopefully. So just a bit about myself before I start, to, so you can place my background and, and maybe tell a bit my story, how I ended up at Siemens and the work I do now. So I did a bachelor's and master's in computer science here at ETH. Um, I took a break for a year after my master's, went to industry for a year, to, did some software engineering then. And then I came back to ETH and got a PhD in the Global Information Systems Group, which doesn't exist anymore because uh, Professor Nori is retired now. But that's where I got my PhD, um, focusing on web technology and human-computer interaction mostly. And now I, I like to say I have three jobs, which I do, but they're not equally balanced. So, Today I'm here in my role um, with Siemens uh, Smart Infrastructure, which I spend most of my time at, so I work 75% for Siemens. But I also teach at the Lucerne University um, of Applied Sciences and Arts, um, where I teach um, web classes, but also I'm involved in the bachelor projects for the digital ideation program, which I find very exciting. It combines um, computer science with um, design. So we have students from all backgrounds working together. And then finally, my backlink to ETH is I also teach classes with OS5Z. It's more of a hobby, but it still brings me back here sometimes. So I'm here to talk about my work at Siemens. Um, I'm with Siemens Smart Infrastructure building products specifically, so Siemens does a lot of things and sometimes people come to me, oh Siemens, do you do smart fridge stuff, right? I have no idea about that thing, so I, I'm in the building domain, it's about um, heating, cooling, lights, anything that makes buildings um, livable and comfortable and safe for the people inside. I'm in the R&D, so that's research and development, and there specifically I'm with the pre-development. This means I'm somewhat between research at university and product development. So I don't do very foundational research, but I look at new technologies that come out and how they can solve our problems. At the same time, I don't develop products that are sold, but it's more at the level of um, proof of concept prototypes to see if things are feasible, if they scale, etc. And then when it comes to really um, finishing them off to do products, it's usually handed over to other teams, which I find very interesting work. Um, this is something I wasn't aware of before I went to Siemens. So, um, we talk a lot about sustainability, what each of us can do to um, consume less energy, to reduce um, our carbon footprint, and we talk about flying, eating less meat. But a lot of energy is actually consumed by buildings, and this is um, a, a quote I got from the Swiss Federal Office of Energy, and it says that um, at present it's roughly 50% of Switzerland's primary energy that is consumed uh, by building somehow, and a lot of it, you can see here, actually goes to heating, air conditioning, and hot water. And this is something that we deal with at Siemens Building Products. And it's not just Switzerland, so also find some global numbers. And yeah, you can see that 
this is a major consumer and if we can change these numbers, bring them down, we actually have a chance to have an impact. And experts agree that we can bring these numbers down if we have smarter buildings that are more efficient. But I mean, smart, everything is such a buzzword. We have smart fridges or whatever. So when I say hey, smart buildings, what do I actually mean by this? So in the end, it's about um, optimizing energy usage in some way or another. This can be by using space more efficiently. It could also be by finding problems um, remotely, diagnosing problems remotely, so experts don't have to drive back and forth to, let's say, fix the heating. Um, but we're also moving towards distributed energy producers and consumers. So you have photovoltaics on your roof, you have um, e-cars that need to be charged in um, your garage, and somehow this needs to be coordinated, and this is a role that a smart building can take. Another thing is, to predict um, problems in the building before they happen. For example, um, a filter in an air um, handling system becomes um, polluted and the system becomes inefficient. And if we predict this, we, uh, we can someone send someone to exchange the filter and the building becomes more efficient again. There are quite a bit of challenge to make this happen. It sounds so nice and uh, in theory we make the building smarter, all problem solved. Um, so, but the, we have a lot of technical challenges involved and I'm going to talk to you about this um, today. And so even today we have automated buildings. So that means we have systems in the buildings that control the lights, that control the heating. For example, taking into account uh, outside air condition, outside air temperature to turn on the heating or not. And we have a lot of sensors, say for room temperature, brightness, etc. So we already have a lot of data in our buildings today, even when they're maybe not so smart. But um, often the data lacks context. This is some real data from one of our buildings. And you can imagine that in a building we might have 80,000 of these what we call data points. So they could be like a temperature value or a command to evolve to turn on the heating or whatever. But finding in this list of data that may have some meaningful names or not, um, what you need can be very challenging. And so imagine um, someone is in a room, it's too cold, they make a call to the facility management saying it's too cold in here. Now the facility management has to figure out why the room is too cold. And I was a bit surprised myself, maybe you are too, that this is actually not that an easy question to answer, especially in big buildings. If you're in your small home, that's, that's maybe easier. But I mean, even knowing what the room someone is referring to when they say here. So there, there are building management systems that um, display the status of the building. There the room can have a technical name, but maybe the, the users of the building change them to something nicer. So a technical name might be room um, 761. And then the users, for example, we, we have that as well in our um, office that they call, call the rooms inspiration or whatever. So just realizing what room someone is talking about can be a challenge. And then we have to figure out what is actually the temperature in that room to know if it's too high or too low. And then figuring out if it is a normal value. Maybe the person is just really sensitive and the system is behaving as it's expected to behave. So we have to figure out if this is in a normal range. And then if you maybe realize, okay, the temperature is actually too cold, it's not in a normal rate, and we could, for example, go and check if the radiator valves are open. And then, for example, the, the valve could be open, but the water that is flowing in is too cold. So we have to check with the supplying plant whether it's providing the right temperature. And then once we figure out there really is something wrong, we have to maybe inform people, send someone to fix it. We have more questions we might want to answer 
in the building, for example, who is renting the space or um, who even has access to where the heating is so that they can check it and fix it and so on. And what makes it harder is that every building is unique. So usually you have an architect, you have planners involved, and they usually don't just have a blueprint that they take out of a box, but they, they design each system in its own way. So that makes it harder um, for us to um, understand the data that the system produces. And so one way that we are attacking this problem is we are um, building what we call digital building twins. Um, a digital twin is a concept that is not just used in buildings, but in different domains. And what we mean by this is that we have a digital representation of a building that brings together all kinds of information that we have about the building. So it can be construction data, um, so 2D plans, 3D plans, and then we have live data from sensors and actuators. Maybe we have product data that tells us about the equipment, like the heating that is installed. Then we also have engineering data or functional data. So that is data that explains how the system has been programmed, automated. And we could even have customer data that tells us who is renting which space. So that's our goal to integrate all this data into a, such a building twin. And now I'm giving you some insights into the technologies we use to achieve this. And, and that's mainly, I mean, there's a lot more involved, but in this talk I will uh, focus on mainly two things that I'm spending also most time on with my team. So one is the Web of Things standard, um, which tries to solve interoperability in the Internet of Things domain. And then we also use or combine that with semantic web technologies where we try to make um, knowledge machine readable. So, as I said, we try to integrate uh, all sensors and actuators that we have in a building, but it's not like we control everything. So the customer might buy um, temperatures from one vendor and then lights from another vendor, valve actuators from a third one. And they may all use different protocols, data models, etc. So if we don't use the Web of Things, this is more or less what we have. We have different protocols, different products. Each of them speak their own language. Now, if you want to build an application on top, Usually it means that you integrate against all these different protocols and everyone does that. So it's a lot of work that gets duplicated. And I think as computer scientists, we don't like people doing the same thing over and over again. So that's um, when the Web of Things standard came into place. So it, it tries to address that problem and to give a bit of a history background, Matthias Kovac, he used to be at ETH, so the standard actually has roots at ETH as well, so Freedom on Modern's group, they, they were working also on the Web of Things, so yeah, you can see work done here can end up in international standards. And Siemens um, is involved as well with Sebastian Kerbisch, so actually have close ties to people um, creating the standard, so I can also give feedback or get input how to use it directly from colleagues in Germany. So its goal is actually to have one integration layer, so um, you map the data models and the protocol once against this Web of Things model, and then the application can build on top of one model, that's the Web of Things model, and don't have to implement against all the other protocols. So if a new protocol pops up, it can be or should be um, mapped against the Web of Things model, and then you don't even have to change your applications. So um, I want to give you an example of a thermostat. A thermostat is a device that controls the temperature in the room. It has a temperature set point that tells the desired temperature, let's say um, 22 degrees. 
Um, it has a temperature sensor, and if it realizes the temperature is too low, it will open a valve, so the heating gets turned on. Physics happened, temperature goes up, hopefully, and it will close the valve when it realizes the temperature is too high. And here's a, a web of things, thing description, so that's a document that describes this thermostat that says how to communicate with this thermostat. And um, first of all, one web of thing concept is that everything gets an identification, so we have this idea that we can use to um, uniquely address the thing. Then we have um, descriptions how we can interact with the thing, and there are three ways. Um, one is properties, that, so these are values that I can read, in some case, cases write as well, so like the temperature and the temperature set point. The temperature is a sensed value, so, so there's this read-only property set that tells me I can only read this value, but I can't write to it. And then there's the temperature set point, which I can read to know what the temperature should be in the room. Um, I can also write it to change the desired temperature. Then we can have actions. These are longer running changes to a device or more complex changes than just um, writing a property. For example, a device could have an energy mode. When you, when you can tell it to save energy, maybe it will change the set point or whatever, but it uh, it's, can be something more complex. Then we also have events that can tell you when certain conditions are reached, for example, a thermostat could have an event that tells me when it, for some reason, doesn't manage to reach its set point. And you can see here we, we have forms that tell us how we can communicate with the thing. In this case, we have um, HTTP um, forms, which is the, a default, but it could also be mapped to a different protocol than HTTP. But I can give this thing to a machine that understands Web of Things and the machine can uh, communicate with my thermostat. So, for example, it, it can tell me how I can identify the thing and I know what properties, actions and events it has. So, for the thermostat, I now know it has a temperature and the temperature set point properties. I could read the, the value. I know the unit it provides me. And it can also tell me um, how I can write to the temperature. Well, it can tell me that I can't write to the temperature pro property. And it can tell me the, the ranges that I can write to the temperature set point property. So enough information for, for a machine to machine interaction with this thing. So if we look at the, trying to figure out um, whether it, why it's too cold in the room, this already helps to some extent. Um, I can figure out if it's a normal value because I can read the current value and the set point. But it doesn't really help me with the other questions yet. But the thing description has a mechanism how it can be extended with um, more vocabulary. The thing is, the thing description wasn't built for Siemens building products, so it's meant for all of IoT. So, of course, we don't want things like, well, location is something that other domains might need, actually, but, for example, what does it mean that a device is a thermostat? That is not something that should be in the W3C standard. But the thing description has a mechanism how it can be extended with your own vocabulary by using these um, context extensions you can see at the top. So there I can provide links to my own vocabulary or to other standardized vocabulary. For example, instead of saying this thing is just a thing, I mean, we had the title before, but that's just human readable and not really machine readable. But now I can use standardized vocabulary to tell or to express that this thing is not just a thing, it's actually a thermostat. But then to know what it means, what is a thermostat, I can reference or look up the other vocabulary up here. And we can define our own attributes. For example, I can 
we are working on our own vocabulary for defining locations, so I can add this location to my thing description. And now we're actually already in the next topic, so um, there is um, a set of standards that are called semantic web, and it's a, a standard for defining or describing metadata. And um, it consists of several standards and several parts, and one of it is a, the resource description framework. It's a way um, to make statements about things, and it's actually very simple. We always have these triples, they're called. They consist of a subject, a predicate, and an object. So here, for example, I can say that thermostat1 has the type thermostat. And in the next line, I have the statement that the thermostat one has the location um, room 671. There's, there's a bit of um, syntactic sugar up here. So I, here I define my prefixes, which means I can reuse these short names he, down here instead of writing complete URLs all the time. So, this ties in with what we had in the thing description. So thing descriptions um, can be transformed to follow this pattern, and I can then load my thing description into a knowledge graph. So a knowledge graph, um, or the, the ones we use, they are graph databases. So um, the thing description and the triples will form graphs. So I have my um, thing with its properties. Let's say I also have a model, a representation of my building in a similar form. I can also load that into the graph. And um, because everything ha has these unique ideas, I can reference things from one place to another. So maybe you noticed in the thing description, I said it has location and had this, this uh, URI, and it will automatically snap into place with the other data that is already in there if the identifiers match. So this is a way that I can get more information about my building, for example. And there's a query language for these graphs. It's called Sparkle, and it allows me to declare graph patterns that will be searched for in the database. For example, this is a query that selects um, all properties of the thermostat device, and I will get the temperature and the temperature set point here. So this thing here is a, a, a variable. This thing is, is an identifier. This thing is as well an identifier. And so the, the query engine will go look for the graph, find triples that match this part, and will return whatever matches here as a result back to me. We can also do some more complex um, queries, for example, to find the name of the building in which this thermostat was placed. Um, so I follow the location link, and then I can, I can have these um, variables in any place of the, or in any place of this triple um, pattern. So I can say, okay, now I'm looking for a, a building that is somehow connected to this location. So, and this star thing means jump over as many has sublocation links as there, as there are in the graphs. It could be one, it could be zero, could be any number. So I don't have to know how far it is away. I just specify the type of relationship that the, the query engine should look for. I can then restrict um, to say whatever it finds there, it should be a building, because otherwise it might also find floors, for example. And then I just output the label that this has. So um, RDF and Sparkle, that's, that's just uh, the first level. Um, there's also the web ontology language, OWL, that um, adds more um, expressiveness, so we can define our pro uh, properties. For example, we can say connected to is a sub-property, so it's a specialized form of next to, so 
that's, for example, we use connected to to say there's a door between two rooms, whereas next to just means they are, there could be a wall but doesn't say anything about the door. And then we can, for example, say it's symmetric, so if room is A is next to room B, room B is also next to room A. And we can say whatever uses um, connected to its domain should be a room and its range should be a room as well. And I think what also makes, or what was new to me coming maybe from a more SQL world, that everything is a triple. So the schema is expressed in triples, but the data, the instances themselves are also represented as triples. And we can introduce reasoning. So if we use the kinds of schemas that I showed just now with the connected to, we can use this information and deduce new knowledge. For example, if I say room 671 is connected to room 672, I can infer that both of them must be rooms because connected to was defined to um, work on rooms. Then, because connected to is a sub um, relationship of next to, I know the two rooms are also next to each other. And then because I defined the relationship as symmetric, um, I know that um, room 672 is also next to room 671. So if we come back um, to our questions, what can we answer now with such a knowledge graph behind this? Um, if we go look at this question, so we could try to find the radiator walls for this room, we can also try to answer maybe this question, where is here? And I have a Sparkle query for that. It's maybe a bit simplified for the example. But for example, rooms changing names, I can, I can add multiple labels to the, um, to the room. So even if the technical name is room 671, I can also query for the label. Of course, it needs to be in the system. Um, I will then try to find a device that has this location and is at the same time of this type thermostat. And I will look for a second device that also has the same location, but is of type radiator. And this query will, for example, give me the name of the room, all the thermostats it finds. It's actually, it will repeat um, this part here and then all the radiator it finds. So it will give me one row in the results for each time or each combination that the query matches. So with that, I think we can say we can answer this question. Where is here? We can kind of answer depending on if the data is actually there. Um, for the heating plant, I haven't shown you this, but we, we can express the same information, what heating plant is a radiator connected to, also in this graph pattern. Then uh, the last one, I didn't put the check mark because um, this data we haven't actually tried to integrate yet. Um, I think it can also be put into that structure, but um, yeah, we haven't gotten around to this yet. And maybe that also brings me to, to this quote here to wrap up. I, I heard this before, um, it's attributed to Phil Carlton says, there are only two hard things in computer science, cache invalidation and naming things. I don't know much about cache invalidation, but I spend a lot of time talking to people within our company how to name these relationships because these schemas, they don't exist yet. So we have to agree on what, how is the building structured, what relationship exists, um, what relationships do we infer, and, and what should we call these things and relationships. And that's, that's maybe not a technical part, but it also takes up a lot of time to agree on. And if there's no agreement, then it won't be used. So it's important to have this as well. So I can, uh, I can confirm that, at least for me, this quote is true as well. And 
just to advertise a quick um, event we have um, soon at Siemens in Zug. Um, if you're interested in this kind of thing, uh, my colleague um, will talk about Web of Things again in more depth. There will also be some technical talks about uh, security. So yeah, have a look if, if you find this interesting. And yeah, also feel free to reach out to me. You can add me on LinkedIn. I can sometimes hire students as interns or offer bachelor or master thesis. So if this is your thing, feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to chat. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, now we have time for, uh, for a few questions. Are there any questions in the room? Okay. Well, thank you for your talk. And I just have one question. Uh, how can you guarantee when the uh, interoperability? This uh, standard looks very nice. Um, but I saw, for example, the unit was stored as a string. One when the just defines this as Celsius, one defines this as C, one defines this as Celsius with a big C. How can we guarantee uh, when the interoperability here, which is the goal of this? It's a good point. Um, I think this is actually a thing where the, the standard might need improvement because now, as you say, it's just a string. There's actually also ontologies, so standardized libraries for units where where you wouldn't put the string, you would actually put its identifier. And I, I agree this would be more precise than to have a, the string because then you could even do automatic conversion because you, you can also encode the conversion rules and it's not dependent on uh, one writing the unit in German and one in English, so yeah. So um, you said that this is an <coughs> R&D product and I just want to um, figure out how can you actually sell this in the future and how can you productize it? Because you said that you are building an application based on the layer that's sort of this uh, web of things layer, right? That should have been um, a new standard that's gonna be used. But like um, you also said in the beginning that every building is specific. Uh, meaning that maybe some buildings are and uh, equipments there and uh, signals that they're using are actually not according to the standard. So how do you see this as a product in the future and how are you going to bridge this gap so that you can actually use it in practice and that these signals will be mapped according to the standard? There, there are some efforts on making this a product. I'm not on that team myself, but they are um, offering more simplified APIs um, to the, uh, the client. So they, you lose some of the power you have when you have direct access to, to the graph, but they will, for example, give you um, an API that gives, gets you all room and rooms and then all sensors in the room and directly give you access to the values. So essentially it's making it more simple, a trade-off, um, I think against the power that you have um, if you expose the complete graph. And I think then, then it's also building services on top. So maybe you don't, maybe that's also a question whether a customer that has a building actually wants this graph or if they just want an application that optimizes energy usage. And that's something you would build on top of what I showed you today. Um, you spoke about reducing uh, power consumption. Do you think that automation and putting sensors in every room is the key to reduce power consumption in buildings? So I'm not myself an uh, expert in energy. So there I rely on <laughs> Yeah, experts. And I think th they have shown this, that um, automation can help um, reduce power consumption. It, it's not, I think it, it's not enough. I, I think also how we build the buildings um, in, 
insulation, etc., makes a big difference. But it has been shown, I think, in studies that automation can bring it down. I'm not sure if it applies to all buildings of all scales, if it also applies to family, like single family homes. Or So what I talked about here, um, we mostly work with bigger buildings, like such a building we're in right now. And I think for that it has been shown that automation helps, yeah. Do we have some questions online? Okay, there's no online questions. Are, are there any questions still open in the room, anyone? If not, uh, thank you again very much, Maria. Um, and we'll be back in a few